38 IZ videos. This is Val Tapia. Today, our guest musician is somebody who was recently in town, actually, at a, a, a concert that we were part of, actually, the, a retreat we were uh, part of called Billy Cobbins, The Art of the Rhythm Section Retreat. And this gentleman was actually one of the coaches that week. So we happened to meet very briefly at there, and we asked if he would be willing to do an interview for us. And as gracious as he was, and he said he's willing to uh, talk to us and talk to the viewers out there. And without further ado, this is, in short, it's, he was a founding member of the band War, and also is currently a, a been the Lowrider band, and we'll explain that a little bit later. But without further ado, via Skype, we have Mr. Lee Oscar. Lee Oscar, how are you doing? I'm doing good, man. Good. I'm, I'm um, life is great with or without me, and I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let me get started, Lee. This is a a very cool interview for me because this will be the very first harmonica play I've got to speak to. And um, give us a little bit of a background. And, and as a musician, what was your interest in harmonica? What 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 made that that music the musical weapon of choice for you? Oh, I it wasn't that cut and dry. It was uh, harmonica basically was uh, an, uh, the instrument at that particular summer uh, when. Uh, a friend of the family from America came to visit us in Copenhagen, where, where I was born and raised. And that summer, harmonica was the end thing. And uh, I was so happy that I got a harmonica. And uh, from the moment I got it, uh, just breathing in and out on it, it sounded like music to me. Because harmonica just is that amazing. Like uh, It's like no other instrument. You can just breathe as you do. To, <laughs> you have to breathe in and out. and. Uh, and uh, what you get is some amazing music sounds. And uh, it was with me since then. So from that day one, I've been connected with it right up to here now. Uh, what are, growing up, uh, what were some of the, the albums of music you liked as a kid? Who were some of your influences? Yeah, you see, that question doesn't even, is not even relative to, to my background. You know, today, People think of records and all that. Back in those days, the best I had in in hearing music uh, was a radio, mm -hmm. and radio mm -hmm. was not like. See, there's two category. There are two categories for music. One is called, you know, for why people have categories for music is one is for marketing, and the other one is for librarians. And back in those days, radio was radio. I could have uh, classical music and an opera, and I could have uh, Louis Armstrong, jazz, I mean, it, it, Perry Como, it didn't matter, it was just music, same same show. So I was, I was hearing music, I was in love with music. Now, the future, in the future, when I got hip to Ray Charles, like Crying Time, that album, uh, was years later after I came to America, uh, that blew my mind. And since I heard Ray Charles on the Crying Time album, that I would say became significantly a huge influence on how I play. Uh, the way he sings is the way I like to phrase. Um, when I play harmonica, I'm singing. It's my my voice as a singer. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever get the good fortune of being able to see Ray Charles live? No, I'm. Uh, well, no, I take it back. I I did see him live one time at uh, Shea Stadium when when war was the headliner wow and i didn't understand back in those days how can we be a headliner with when he's like the greatest <laughs> and uh being naive to the fact that it really had nothing to do with the music it has to do with whoever the promoter feels is they can exploit to bring sell more tickets mm. and so you know but uh, the sound system uh, at Shea Stadium at the Newport Jazz Festival was terrible. And Ray Charles, the, the stage was in the middle of the baseball arena, right in the middle of the field. And the and people sitting up on these, um, on the, whatever you call it, uh, far away. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just terrible. Hmm. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And then when we got up and played, the sound sucked. <laughs> and I got so frustrated that I went back uh, underneath the, where you go into the, the dress rooms, you know, in baseball, whatever you call the dugout, mm -hmm. 
and and Hal Ween, who was the um, the promoter, or George Ween, I'm sorry, George Ween was the promoter, and I did, I just went up to him and told him, your sound system sucks, and everybody got nervous on our camp because, you know, they didn't want me to blow something in case they're going to get a good deal with them, you know, all that stuff. And uh, George Ween says, you know, the kid is right. <laughs> the sound system sucks. It was terrible. <laughs> What, what year was fun. that? When Ray Charles was uh, played with you guys, what year was that? Uh, you know, I don't remember exactly. I, obviously, it was early 70s. Right. I don't remember the exact year. Gotcha. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Um, to go a little forward, um, give us the time when you met Eric Burden. Uh, at that point, he was uh, had left the animals and or around that time, and you formed what was Eric Burden and War. Give us a little background on how you met him and um, what, was, what was both of your visions for for being in a band? Well, I mean, I, uh, oh, um, I mean, I, my whole, th my whole, uh, thing about being a, being in LA and, and whatever it took, you know, to make, make my career. I mean, I was deaf to one of, I was for the music mm -hmm. and there was a club mm -hmm. called the experience that I used to go in and they let me in for free in those jam sessions all the time there. And Eric Burden would come in there, and so Eric and I met, and we would sit in with uh, a band called The Blues Image that just came into town from Florida. And uh, Mike Panera was on guitar. Anyhow, that band, uh, uh, myself and Eric, we jam a lot. Mm -hmm. And so Eric wanted to put a new band together, and uh, then Blue Simmons made a deal at Atco Records and came out that tune, Ride Captain Ride, or whatever it was called. Uh, Eric and I went then to see this other band that we were told about, and that was in North Hollywood called The Ragdoll. And uh, Eric uh, and I went there to check the band out, and I got up and jammed with the band. And the rest is history. The next day we were sitting around a swimming pool, and, and I was part of an amazing... Uh, thing for me i mean i i was in awe i was with eric burton i mean he was like this like a superstar and uh felt a lot i felt like my career is coming <laughs> i'm i'm here at the right time right place it's a, that doesn't happen every day right and then from then on it was an amazing musical journey uh, with all the guys in war you know how we just jammed music every day with uh, eric and made stuff up on the spot and it's been a it's been a great great journey for me musically. Um, up to right now, I'm just I just feel like it gets better and better. How um how would you say that when when Eric Burden left War, um, you guys did two records together, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how do you think the sound developed after he left? Because many fans, if you go by what what you read online, many fans say that War really became War arguably after Eric Burden's departure. Is that is that fair to say? Well, I don't know. I mean, sure, everything is fair. I mean, I mean, realistically, you know, uh, we were the backup band for Eric Burton. So it was Eric Burton and War. Right. And, uh, you know, anything, anything, everybody's chemistry is, is, is always a big part of anything. Right. And so the chemistry between us as a band without Eric certainly took on a different life than than it was when we would play behind Eric where Eric would make the decisions on what tunes we he wants to us to learn and play mm -hmm. or every day when we didn't really play any tunes we would just make stuff up it was basically backing up Eric uh, he would make up stuff and be right there with him so uh, where where we in common no matter what with with Eric without Eric is that uh, the same guy same chemistry I mean in the zone in the moment would always you know it's going to have a sound and based on how we play but when we became as war without Eric um, uh, you know and we keep growing musically together there's definitely many things come about that we you know that's going to set us apart, I guess. You know. One of the questions I love to ask uh, musicians of your generation are, 
the eclectic bills uh, ch that the tours would take would be about. You would see, it wasn't uncommon to see very disparate types of music on one stage at that time. What were some, of, who were some of the bands uh, that War toured with that were some of your personal favorites? You mentioned Ray Charles earlier. What, name some of the bands you guys were fortunate enough to be able to tour with. Well, first of all, we, a lot of the stuff we did when we were on the road was never really touring. We did a few things touring with, uh, with some other bands which was not even my favorite uh, times. I mean, uh, hmm. Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Um, I, I just didn't care for uh, uh, some of the things there. But most of the times when we were on the road and doing concerts and tours, it was pretty much like we, we like for example, when it was, um, hmm, when, when we were in, in uh, uh, Europe, when Woodstock, when Woodstock happened, we actually went to Europe and played, and we would cross each other's path. Bob Marley, which was amazing to us because we were huge fans of Bob Marley, and then we find out that that uh, Bob Marley actually was a fan of of our stuff, and he actually did a lot of our music before he actually got um, you know known or got uh, you know got uh, to do the music that we hear that we were amazed of. But prior to that, he was actually playing war stuff. So we had, we, we would kick the ball, soccer ball around, his bus and our bus. I remember one place in Europe where, and Kiss was on the same show. Wow. But but rarely do we, rarely do, even if we have the same bill, do we actually take time or we have time to actually talk and, and hang out together? Because it's like one nighters, and you 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 get the barely in time to play, set up and play, and then afterwards you sometimes uh, unfortunately you have to leave. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's you, it's not as often as I would wish to I would like to have said that we, we had a chance to really hang out, even if we're in the same bill. You know? Right. Uh, uh, reminder: We're speaking with Lee Oscar, founding member of War and a current member of the Lowrider Band. And we're just talking about uh, life as what Lee Oscar has been doing the past 50 years and going, having a, have a fun conversation. Um, to go a little further, uh, Lee, if you had to name a favorite war album, what is it and, and why? And give us a little uh, background on the making of your favorite album. Well, I, I think every album, uh, every album uh, other than uh, there's a couple of ones I, I would say I didn't like. Uh, when they got into all this stuff, uh, the music band and uh, mm. and the management was trying to, <laughs> it, it was impossible for a band like us to, to be anything but a jam band. And they were trying to wear, make us wear this clothes and like the, um, the music band, which was, uh, you know, the disco time and all that stuff. What a joke. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, but uh, anyhow, other than that, there was a couple of albums. Everything else to me was uh, uh, was very special. I mean, you know, I, I, I it's an amazing feeling. It has always been for me is that uh, to have the opportunity to be part of a band and where you play and create every day. You get to experience your things in music. You get to you get to uh, explore uh, within yourself and among everybody else every day. It's an amazing growth. It's an amazing journey. And then those jams, some of that stuff gets gets put into uh, in a studio, and then you listen to it and you edit it and you make and you finish it up with songs. But they all have special meanings to me. I mean, uh, every one of you, you can name any tune on any albums, and most likely I will remember. Uh, the whole process of when I was there and what I did. I mean, it, it's always been very special. Yeah. Um, so now we're gonna I, know, I know you want to get some <laughs> some amazing profound answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's fair. I mean, some people, some musicians can't say what their favorite album is. That's 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 fair. But I will say this: it was interesting to say what you didn't like <laughs> more than what you like, which is which is kind of funny. But um, no, yeah, that's I mean, yeah, yeah, because the, everybody, you know, the interesting thing is, like, okay, here's here's an example. We were a band that always jammed, so 
we could play the same tune every night, World is a Ghetto, Gypsy Man, Slipping in Darkness. And every night we would play it, we never play the same way. Uh, I know a lot of bands who have every little thing spelled out. I mean, I can't imagine, I would go crazy. I mean, so they would have to play exactly bar to bar, the same thing. There's not even, uh, there's not even room for, for anything to be jammed. Mm. Now, you know, and it's amazing how long, as, as even though bands get short-lived and quit, I'm surprised they can even live as long as they are. I mean, after three nights of playing the same exact way, I'd say I quit. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and then they do it for years. Now, we were a band that every time we played was in the moment. So it was, it was, always, it was always in real time. Uh, if we did a TV show, uh, and we were like one of the first rock bands back in those days we were on, on, on major you know, nat- national TV. I remember we won, like, I don't know if it was Mary Griffin or Mike Douglas show, one of these talk shows, and we were doing Cisco Kid, and they had the, uh, the cameras walking through just to, get, just to get an idea where, you know, for, you know, as a rundown before they actually video it. So they know when what cameras to ro- to you know when to zone in and all that. Right. And we started Cisco Kid, and we like ten minutes into the tune, and we would just feel like we we're getting started. And there's this person who finally opened my eyes, and he's he's trying to stop us. <laughs> and by the time we all stopped, we were like, we were like, uh, well, like I don't know what word I can use on, on this. I can cuss, right. but like, we, we were. <laughs> We weren't happy that right. uh, how, this is sacred. You, how do you, how dare you stop us? And then the producer, like like God, up there says, "Your record is three minutes and fifty eight seconds." So we were forced to go into the green room and had to listen to our own forty five. And there ain't nowhere in the world, based on the way we are with each other, and the way we play, is that we can actually replica or tell each other how to play. We would never. Ne- I mean, nobody in this band would could ever tell anybody else how to play. Right. What you hear, if you hear my harmonica playing, ba 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 ba. I mean, that's that's the line me and Charles did. Uh, the bass line, boom, 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 boom. that's BB Dickerson. And nobody would could tell anybody else what to play. There would be a fight. And so to try to learn something that was edited and, uh, as a single, forget it. That's so. So I guess well, what you're, I guess another way to say that is you're not interested in, in playing live and just sounding like your record. You want to take it to a, a give it new life on stage. Is it fair to say? Oh, always in the moment, always. But I, I, the funny part of it is that when we were like one of those bands where it's supposed to be three minutes and fifty eight seconds, and and they're going to fade out to go to a commercial. I mean, obviously a lot of fans that. Uh, who, why we want to show is to draw fans to watch the show. And I can imagine fans say, hey man, they just, they just cut them off, you know? Right. So, uh, so I think TV learned uh, to try to do other ways. So they did lip singing and that didn't work either. So finally they caught up with something that came out of America many years before that. It's called Music Minus One and an amazing product that came out of the USA. And that music minus one was on real, real tapes. So jazz people or singers, anybody could, with these background arrangements, could sing and, and or jam to it. I mean, that's what we call today TV mixes. So when you mix something today, you also mix it without the vocals, without the solo, different versions. So when you do live on TV, uh, you actually got a backup track that is, that is exactly pristine to what the time of from beginning end is, you know, and yet it doesn't look like you're lip syncing because you're actually singing with the track. So that's that that came a long ways after television tried to get rock and roll, uh, and people like us jamming was not a was not very compatible in the beginning. Mm. What about a let's still think about War's influence on rap and hip hop? Uh, in point of fact, uh, War even or a version of War in the early 90s, 1992, I think, sanctioned a, sanctioned a tribute album uh, called Rap Declares War. Uh, give us the background on that, and um, how flattering is it to see uh, so many in the hip-hop community uh, praising War as such a, a crucial influence? 
Well, uh, first of all, it's the last thing you just said, it, it is, to me, it's, it's an honor, uh, it's, it's flattering that that uh, the stuff that we, you know, all the recordings that we we got out there uh, resonates with uh, with hip hop and uh, you know these rappers and these people uh, who are to me some of them. Uh, I mean, it's an amazing form. It's no, I mean, it's as much of an art as anything else. Agreed. And and a lot of the hip hop people back in the days, um, before it got really homogenized. They were actually the first people who actually learned how to use Pro Tools. Um, and now Pro Tools is used with everybody. But Pro Tools, so they were able to sample things and uh, and they chose things from our music that they sampled. But what happened was sampling to me when they do that is no different than, than you know, if you ever seen a photographer, you know, somebody who takes uh, cuts out from newspaper, magazines, whatever it is, from different photographs and that and makes a collage. And when you stand back and look at it, it looks like it's an amazing, it looks like a realistic face, let's say. And then you get close and you see it's just tiny pieces of cut out of, uh, uh, of newspaper, magazines, photographs that actually like little pictures within. Well, it's no different sound wise when they sample and they create these things, they're called beats, loops, whatever, but they got, Listen, there's always been mediocrity. It doesn't matter if it's hip hop, in, in jazz, anything. Uh, you know, uh, maybe one percent of humanity is excellent, but there's, so there's always going to be great stuff, no matter what the art is. It's not you, so you can't di ditch and say uh, sampling is not an art. It's as much an art as anything else. But mm -hmm. what happened to us is a lot of those cats had no clue about the, the legal side. But the record companies who were supporting the hip hop and rap stuff, they knew the legal side. You know, they just didn't face the other way and, uh, you know, didn't bother edu educating the, the hip hop people. So the hip hop people would put stuff out and then get sued because when, when it was identified, hey, you'd use the baseline from Slipping the Darkness or you used this and that, then all of a sudden there was these lawsuits. So once everybody got on the same page, uh, then everybody knows today is that you know it's it's okay to sample things, but you just got to give credit to uh, where properties, intellectual properties you 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 literally uh, took it from and work out the the sync rights or the the master rights and whatever it's got to be worked out. It's it's so it's squeaky clean. So I, so um, wrapped the. Uh, um, uh, uh, that thing we did with all the rappers and all that was a way uh, the ex-manager of, uh, well, my ex-manager um, came up with, a, you know, one of the hustles was is to get uh, uh, everybody to agree who had sampled our stuff to, to let it be also uh, a compilation that a master would be put together that he would own or run. So, you know, everybody's doing slick business. But the outcome of that, more than that, uh, war does rap or rap or whatever it's called. Mm. The outcome today is that it, the art itself, I think, has been more respected, and everybody understands the business and the legal side of things. So, so there's no uh, no confusion. There's, it's more legit today. But the art has always been wonderful. Great. Um, just a couple more questions. Lee, thank you so much for your time. You're a very interesting guy. We, we, we just barely scratched the surface. So uh, thank you so much for your time. But one more, uh, uh, one more question, if I may. Um, I actually asked you about this briefly at the uh, Billy Cobham uh, retreat last two weeks ago. And um, is it time for war to be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? You guys have now been nominated three times uh, in 2009, uh, 2012 and 2015, respectively, and uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe it's a three-year, you know, offer. I'm not sure, but uh, maybe, perhaps 2018, maybe you see a fourth nomination. Um, I guess to go a little further, do you think there's a possibility for all the surviving members of War, including the the other band War? Uh, do you think you'll be able to um, uh, come together and hopefully play songs with a surviving member of War if you guys or when you guys get inducted? Well, uh, the short answer, of course, uh, uh, 
you know, I would say yes to um, to anything that's going to honor who 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 really did, uh, you know, you know the people behind the stuff, and right. and that would be obviously including Lonnie Jordan, would be Charles Miller, Papa D. Allen, who has passed away. Those two guys. Right. And still alive is also Hale Brown, Howard Scott, P.B. Dickerson is not doing well, but he's still with us, mm -hmm. and myself. And, um, and uh, you know, um, the problem really is that there's a band out there that's called War, because the ex-manager owns the name War. And we have a restraining order, including me, that I'm not allowed to use the name War. I'm not even allowed to say formally of War, Anytime, if tickets are going to be sold for me to do a, a, a debut, a concert, a, a, you know, play, right? I can't even say we can't even say Formula War. We can we close out the Lowrider band. We can't say Formula War. Right. And yeah. I and, and unfortunately, the band that's out there using the name War is to me is is um, it's really just a trippy band. And I can tell you, I heard two other trippy bands, and to me, they are not a trippy band. Out there called um, Cisco, the Cisco Kid Band, I believe. And in my opinion, they're a much better tribute band than the band that wants to call themselves War. Mm. So, uh, but they're all trippy bands. They're not the original guys, except for one guy, Lonnie. And um, and if if all was for real, then they wouldn't have to pretend that they are the original guys. They would just say War a tribute band or whatever. And then I think it would be easier for all of us to be indoctrinated, nominated, indoctrinated, because I think Rock and Hall of Fame a little skitzy about uh, about being fooled. Because I heard at one point uh, the phony band, as I call it, or the, or the not the, the, the original guys, mm -hmm. uh, whatever that band out there called the War is, almost got through into into the. Uh, the Rock Hall of Fame, this is what I heard, and they caught it just in time. And and that's not fun, that's embarrassing. And so I think, to be honest with you, I mean, maybe I'm stepping out of line to say the truth, but the truth is that, you know, it's, the music should be a, something to enjoy, something to celebrate. And the fact that there's this bad vibe, this negative thing about, you know, uh, not being sincere and not being and and, and just it's it, it it carries over to not uh just bad energy so rock and hall of fame i think they're kind of afraid to even touch it hmm. and um uh, i can say one more thing about that is that if if we the original guys were indoctrinated uh, but they want to call it war, then the ex-manager would have to give rights. If they videotape it, which is they, what they want to do, then the ex-manager also owns the publishing. He would have to give sync rights. So if it's a conflict to the ex-manager because uh, it's not the, the phony band coming in there, but it's, it's the original guys, if that's a conflict to them, it'll never happen. Mm. But if we all, the original guys, can be embrace each other, and just be honored for what we've done, rather than rather than pretend and put, you know. Right. Uh, just that's all. So yeah. you know. Um, and I I hope uh, on the legal side I can say honestly what I'm saying because uh, it's the truth. Well, well. Hopefully, the, you guys will be able to. If that happens, like I said, uh, hopefully you guys can uh, reconcile your differences and and do hopefully the best for the fans. I'm sure the fans would love to see the Survivor Members Award do play one more time. And um, what a way to end it for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right. Vote for us. Vote for us. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Lee. I got to let you go. Uh, we could talk forever, but hopefully when the Lowrider Band comes through town, we'll definitely say we're more than happy to spread the word on it. Thank you very much. Thank You're you welcome. For having... Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.